This is the iPhone 14 Pro. And if you don't look closely, you might actually mistake it for the iPhone 13 Pro or even the iPhone 12 Pro. And that's because Apple is doing what Apple does best, which is iterate. Now, when I say that the iPhone 14 Pro is iterative, that may sound bad or negative, but actually I mean it in the most positive way because the iPhone gets iteratively better each and every year with the exception of the regular 14 this year, those changes add up to a lot of change. Sponsored by ESR. So let's see what's different with the iPhone 14 Pro this year. And we can start with the design, which is the area where this seems to be the least iterative between the iPhone 13 Pro and the iPhone 14 Pro. Starting off with the color, I decided to go with space black to get away from the trendy colors of the year. So this year they have deep purple, last year it was Sierra blue, and before that it was Pacific blue. And the Pacific blue was a lot better than Sierra blue and deep purple I just don't care about. This space black is really, really nice. It is super dark, like Darth Vader's helmet or the old trash can Mac. The stainless steel is just gorgeous, except for the fingerprints, I love it a lot. And of course you can use it with any case because it's black, so it'll go with basically any color case that you wanna to add to it. Now this is the 6.1 inch version, the non-max version, and compared to last year's 6.1 inch Pro, this model is slightly heavier and slightly taller. The weight difference between the 14 Pro and the 13 Pro is pretty much negligible, but you do feel that big difference between the 14 Pro and the regular 14. On the back, the camera bump is slightly larger than the camera bump on the 13 Pro. However, it's not that much bigger. It's not super noticeable unless you're holding side by side. And the cameras of course have been updated. We'll talk about this in just a moment. There's the new adaptive True Tone. And then on the front side, the big difference of course is going to be the removal of the notch and the addition of the dynamic island. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. The last thing to point out as far as the design goes, and it's probably gonna be hard to see on the camera, is that there's the removal of the SIM slot. So there is no longer, in the US at least, a SIM slot on the iPhone 14 Pro and the iPhone 14. So you really have to move to eSIM, there's no other option. And my experience of moving to the eSIM with AT&T was pretty much flawless. I've heard some stories online about it not going so great, but at least in my experience, it went well. So hopefully it will for you too. Inside the iPhone 14 Pro, you get a brand new A16 processor. This is a six core CPU, five core GPU processor built on a new four nanometer process. Compared to the A15 in the iPhone 13 Pro from last year, the A16 is about 10 to 15% faster with a 50% faster memory bandwidth. And what that equates to is, I have no idea because I can't tell. These are so fast that going from one generation to the next, you really can't notice it. There is no application that will run exclusively on the A16 inside the iPhone 14 Pro compared to last year's iPhone 13 Pro. So performance wise, it's exactly as you would expect from the newest iPhone of the year. It is incredibly fast. You're not gonna have an issue running any app that you can run on an iPhone. When it comes to battery life, it's really hard to test battery life over the first week or two or maybe even three weeks of having a brand new iPhone. And that's for a number of reasons. First is when you first set up a brand new iPhone, it indexes, it checks all the applications, it downloads all your mail, it downloads all of this background data for your applications. It makes sure your iCloud photo library is up to date, right? It is all these things that eat up your battery in the background. Plus you use it a lot when you have a brand new phone. So battery tests from regular usage are kind of hard to pin down in the first few weeks of owning a new iPhone. But in the last week of using this iPhone 14 Pro, my battery life has been pretty similar to what I get on my iPhone 13 Pro after about a year. Now, again, that's not super awesome and my iPhone 13 Pro is down to a battery health of about 93%, but there may be other contributing factors to that at this time, including you know the always on display, which we'll talk about in a moment. So there's a number of things that can contribute to a new phone and the battery not living up to expectations. But Apple says that the battery life should be slightly longer on the 14 Pro compared to the 13 Pro with up to 23 hours of video playback. But the good news is that you can actually charge your iPhone faster this year with up to 25 watts of fast charging with the iPhone 14 Pro and up to 27 watts with the Pro Max. That's of course using a lightning cable and something like the Apple 30 watt power adapter. But who wants to really use a lightning connector with their iPhone in 2022? I like to charge magnetically. That's my preferred way to charge. And speaking of charging, you can level up the MagSafe on your iPhone 14 Pro with the ESR Halo Lock 3-in-1 charger with CryoBoost. This 3-in-1 charger will charge your iPhone, AirPods, and your Apple Watch at the same time. 
But the best thing about this is the Cryo Boost, which actively cools the charger and the back of your iPhone. This allows your iPhone to charge completely in about three hours while still using your iPhone to watch videos, compared to about seven hours with the MagSafe charger. There's also a convenient night mode for charging at night next to your bed. When you're on the go, ESR has power with a snap with the Halo Lock Kickstand Wireless Power Banks to keep you up and running with either a 5,000 mAh or 10,000 mAh model. These Halo Lock Power Banks can actually charge your device wirelessly when attached to the back of your iPhone or wired using the USB-C connection on the battery pack. You can also use the adjustable kickstand on the back to hold your iPhone up. And if you need a case, ESR has you covered with this Christec Clear Case for a protective case with a clear view of your new iPhone, or a classic kickstand case with Halo Lock. This adds the Halo Lock magnets to the back to work with other Halo Lock or MagSafe accessories. This case has a built-in kickstand where the camera guard flips out, and now you have a stand to rest your iPhone on to watch a video, take a meeting, or whatever hands-free activity you need. You can level up your tech and save 20% on these ESR accessories by using the links and the codes in the description below, or by searching ESR Halo Lock on Amazon. The iPhone 14 Pro also has some pretty decent upgrades to the display as well, including up to 1600 nits for HDR content. So now you can really sear your eyeballs on an airplane if you're watching a movie, if that's what you're into. And maybe more importantly, you can get up to 2000 nits of brightness outside to actually see your display in the sun. Now that sounds pretty good. And it is pretty good. When you pull your phone out of your pocket and you look at your phone to get your notifications or quickly check an email or a message, it works really well in direct sunlight, but only for a period of time, because when you're in the sun and outside, this display starts to heat up, especially when it's that bright and the whole phone heats up. So the display starts to dim down so that it doesn't overheat. And I found that that starts to take place pretty quickly when using your phone outside. Like I'm saying a matter of two minutes or less, I'm seeing the display start to dim. And after a couple minutes, it really gets down to a point where you almost can't see the display at all. That's not great. And partially I'm wondering if using a case is contributing to that. I mean, obviously it must be right because you're holding in heat on the iPhone, but that's still not great to only get just a couple of minutes of good screen viewing time when outdoors. I mean, it's better than what we've had in the past, but it's still, it seems to throttle back and get dim really quickly, making it almost useless to have this feature. And another change to the display this year is that new always on display. For the first time, see, as you just saw, for the first time, the iPhone has an always on display, which allows you to see the time and the date and a couple of widgets and eventually live notifications down at the bottom without the screen being fully on. And it's pretty cool that Apple finally has an always on display mode for the iPhone. In the announcement, they talked about how they don't just dim the display, they make sure to do certain things. So especially if you have a photo of a person, it will adjust so it doesn't mess up the skin tones. I mean, that's pretty cool. They put logic into the always on display. But since I haven't had this for the last 15 years, it almost messes with me thinking that the phone is just on all the time. Like I keep forgetting to lock it or I have the display settings to never turn off the display. Well, I mean, technically I do with always on display, but you know what I mean. It's been pretty difficult to get used to and I'm not sure that I necessarily like it. Now I have had the opportunity to play around with it in different settings, including at home or on a walk and CarPlay and it works fine. And what's cool is it does leave things on the always on display so you can see what's going on. So for example, when playing music and the display goes to you know, always on mode, you see the progress of the song that you're listening to. Now you have to tap it to kind of wake it up to make it say, okay, you know, what do you want to do? And then once you do, you can play, pause, you can fast forward, rewind or next song, whatever. And it works with Apple Maps too. So if you're in your car and you have your phone mounted somewhere in your vehicle, you'll still get, you know, turn by turn directions and information about your maps without your display being fully on. So I can see how that's going to be helpful and nice in certain scenarios, but for my day-to-day -day regular usage of the phone, I find it more distracting than I do useful. So I'm not sure if I'll keep it on. I'll give it another couple of weeks, see how it feels, but I may end up turning that off. Of course, when I start using apps that have live notifications, whether that's waiting for a ride share or flying somewhere, flight status, that may become more useful to have. However, I'll still be pulling the phone in and out of my pocket all day if I'm doing that kind of stuff and the display is gonna turn on anyway. So I don't know, what do you guys think? And now one of the most interesting features to come out of the iPhone 14 Pro is that dynamic island, henceforth known as island in this video. 
when Apple announced this thing, I was so excited that they were able to take something that should have been a negative about a phone and seemingly turn it into something fun and cool and something that's never been done before. The iLine interacts with applications and system level features in a fun, different way, something we've never seen before. This is a totally different type of paradigm. And you can see it from something just as simple as the lock screen. So right now you can see that it's locked, but when I raise the phone, it kind of sees my face and then it unlocks and it just kind of expands and contracts. And it will expand and contract for a growing list of things like face ID. So you can see that it pops up, it scans my face and then it goes away. That's pretty cool. Even Apple Pay. So I can open up Apple Pay, it scans my face, it kind of does this little thing and it goes away. It's kind of this fun thing that just pops up, says, hey, what's up? I'm doing something and then it goes away into its own little thing. And just like with maps and music with the always on display, the island works with maps and music and other applications as well. So I started directions to a Home Depot because it seems like I live there half of the year anyway. And you can see up here, we get the turn by turn directions inside of there. And we can also start some music. So if we go to music and we hit play, you can see that there's basically two applications running in there, it splits up. So over here we have our music and if we tap and hold, we'll basically get a little widget that allows us to interact with the application. If we just tap it, it will take us to the application. Now, I kind of wish that it was the opposite. I think Neelai Patel from The Verge mentioned this in a podcast that it really should be like layers. So just tapping it once should be the first layer. So you wanna interact with the application with a single tap. You just wanna be able to adjust something, play, pause, fast forward, whatever. And then if you want to do more, you should have to tap again or long tap from there to get into the application versus just tapping once and going straight to the application. I think that needs to be swapped. It would be better if you just tapped once to get the widget for whatever. The features and the design of the island are going to change over time, especially as more third-party apps start integrating and Apple makes adjustments or dare I say, iterates on it. So I'm really excited to see where this goes. It really is a cool feature. Again, Apple took something that should have been a negative on the design of the display and turned it into something that really is unique and something we've never seen before. Now I do have a couple of issues with the island though. And first of all, because it doesn't just come down like the notch did, it's definitely more distracting or maybe not distracting, but I'm definitely more aware of it than I was of the notch. Like I said in previous videos with the iPhone 10 and on, as soon as you used an iPhone with a notch, the notch just kind of faded away over time. It's, it's the same thing with the 14 inch MacBook Pro and the newer MacBook Air. You see the notch at first and you're like, ugh, but eventually it just goes away because it's not in your way. Well, with this, it doesn't just go away. It's always there, you always see it because of those lit up pixels above it. In some apps, it's okay. You open them up and it's almost like everything's up there in a menu bar, space you can't really use anyway. But in other situations, like in games, it can be incredibly distracting. For example, a first person shooter where you're running around trying to see what's going on and you're trying to make sure nobody comes up to you from the left, the dynamic island blocks a lot of space and it is kind of annoying. So the story of the notch is, it's cool. I can't wait to see what happens with it. It's delightful to use when it pops up and scans your face and does other things. It almost feels alive, but it's kind of annoying. And now the cameras and all of the cameras on the new iPhone 14 Pro have been updated in one way or another. Of course, the biggest feature is that brand new main camera system. The main camera has an updated 48 megapixel sensor, which is four times the size of the previous 12 megapixel sensors that they've been using for, uh, I don't know, like 13 years. During the event, Apple dropped a lot of jargon all over the stage. They talked about deep fusion again, which was sweater mode from, I think the iPhone 12. And then they talked about this new photonic engine. And of course now there's pixel bidding with that 48 megapixel sensor. And none of that matters to the regular user. All that matters is when you take a photo with the iPhone, it looks good. And this year is no different. Well, it's different, it's better, I think, but I mean, it's no different in the fact that you can take a great photo from your iPhone when you're not even trying. Now, let me preface this with, I'm not a pro photographer. I don't have a photographer's eye. I can't really tell the difference between a great photo and a good photo. I can tell you what I like and what I don't like, and I generally like the photos that come out of an iPhone. And in using this over the last week, the differences in the point and shoot photos that I get from the iPhone 14 Pro is not really different from what I get from the iPhone 13 Pro. The colors are slightly different, the contrast is slightly different, but they both look really good and I'm happy with either one. There are a couple of new things in the iPhone 14 Pro that I really do like. And the first thing is that 2X mode. 
With 2X mode, you can actually crop into that main 48 megapixel sensor and essentially get optical zoom. And it gives you some great shots, a great way to zoom without going to that third camera, which has never really been that great. It's a nice way to be able to frame shots a little bit differently without losing any of the quality of that main camera. The next thing that I do like is the Pro Raw on that 48 megapixel camera. Now, again, I'm not a pro photographer, but it is super interesting to be able to take seemingly the exact same photo from the same spot and get two different images with very different sharpness. So taking a look at the tree, the regular photo out of the iPhone, the bark when you zoom in just looks like a slurry mess of, I don't even know what. However, when shooting with Pro Raw mode on the 48 megapixel sensor, you actually get some detail in the bark even when you zoom in this far. It's pretty cool. Along with the 24 FPS 4K cinematic mode, which I may or may not use, the action mode is pretty cool. I gave it a quick test out on the trail this afternoon and look at this difference. The iPhone actually crops in the sensor so you get a smaller field of view, but you get this crazy image stabilization that is just, oh my gosh, unbelievable. It is so cool. I'm actually running on this trail. I think you're going to see a lot of usage of action mode on the new iPhones for people with pets when they're running around with the dog in the yard or chasing kids around. I think it's going to get a lot of use and people are gonna be really happy with it. And I think a lot of people may choose to just use this over getting some other action cam. And this is the new front facing camera for the iPhone 14 Pro and the built-in microphone. And besides having a overall better picture quality on the front facing camera this year, there's also for the first time autofocus on this camera. So whether it's yourself or others in the frame, it will actually focus on you to get you set up. And man, I'm out of breath from that action shot. So like I said at the beginning, this iPhone is iterative, but Apple iterated on a lot of the features, making them all better than last year's model. It's easy to say that this is the best iPhone that Apple has ever made. And I like it a lot. It's like compound interest, right? It grows exponentially over time. Even if it's not a huge upgrade year over year, like over the iPhone 13 Pro, the changes are more drastic the further back you go. So if you're on an iPhone 11 Pro or older, this is going to be a massive jump. But what do you guys think? Are there enough changes to the iPhone 14 Pro for you to consider jumping from whatever iPhone you have now? Let me know below. If you wanna see a comparison of this space black color compared to the midnight color on the regular iPhone 14, check out this video right over here. Hit the thumbs up button if you liked it. Hit subscribe if you want, and I'll see you next time.